who is going to pass the Sunday law? Is it the left or the right? The Democrats or the Republicans? The liberals or the conservatives? Find out today on The Prophetic Eye. Today, we're going to take a look at two videos, and I'm sure that most of you have seen them before. One is from a Republican and the other from a Democrat, but they are both talking about legislation to either encourage or compel people to attend church on Sunday. But before we get to that, we need to take a moment to lay some groundwork to understand the pendulum swing that's taking place in the United States and really what's taking place around the world. We need to look at this as we're going into an election season and more importantly, going into the end of time. There are some things that I deeply believe we need to understand as God's people in light of all the polarization that's taking place and which I know is going to get worse. Everyone is clamoring to be right, and I'm not talking about politically right, but right in an argument. The left is more evil. No, the right is more evil. Blue is better. No, red is better. The leftist Democrats are going to pass the Sunday law with all of their climate change nonsense. No, the rightist Republicans are going to pass the Sunday laws with all of their Christian nationalism nonsense. We're right. No, we're right. Everyone is fighting to prove that God is on their side. But here's the interesting thing, and I'm just throwing this out there. What if God hasn't chosen a side? What if we're the ones that are imbalanced and we need to go to God for him to help us see through all of the nonsense, for him to help us take our eyes off of the kingdoms of this world and look to his coming kingdom? With that in mind, let's take a look at this video clip from several years ago from a Republican politician, and then we'll take a look at a similar one from a Democrat. And I want you to listen very carefully to what's being said. Probably we should be debating a bill requiring every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday. That was Senator Sylvia Allen yesterday talking about the possibility of forcing people to attend church. But today she was walking away from those comments, literally. You don't have any interest in talking about that? No. Thank you. Appreciate it, though. Well, why don't you want to talk to us? Because I don't, don't talk to you. Thank you. You don't talk to me? Nope. However, it didn't take long for her to change her mind. About an hour after 3TV tried speaking to Allen, she took to the Senate floor defending her comments on religion. Last night in a very late appropriation meeting, and we were all extremely tired, uh, I made a remark about uh, America's in a need of a moral rebirth. Allen then said she couldn't understand why her remarks would be controversial to try to bring back this moral rebirth to our country, to turn our hearts back to good things, that that is some sort of amazing thing for me to have said, and that would be offensive to people. Ellen believes the country is heading in the wrong direction, and to prove her point, she told a story about her youth. I can remember, it wasn't until high school I understood there was anything like heroin, drugs. It just wasn't talked about in our society. It was a different time. People prayed, people went to church. Regardless, her initial comments spread across social media. And later, she questioned why her idea of legally requiring church attendance would even be newsworthy. I was chased across the foyer by a Channel 3 news reporter when I said I did not have any comments. She lamented the state of society, the degradation of morals, and she said, maybe we should talk about a law forcing everyone to go to church on Sunday. This was a video from an Arizona congresswoman from a session that took place several years ago. It seemed to be an off-the-cuff statement, so I'm not here to say that she was trying to have a Sunday law passed right there. But it speaks to the mindset of many in the political right. They see the degradation of society. They see the crime. They see the drug addiction. And in their minds, the solution is to get back to God by force if necessary. Please keep that in mind, because we're going to come back to that thought. Now, on to the Democrats. This is a video from a congressman, Chris Murphy, discussing the idea of a 32-hour work week and why implementing that may be necessary. Let's take a look. I wanted to talk to you just a, a little bit about leisure time. You've talked about this already. Um, you, you're, I think you really importantly talk about the importance that your faith plays um, in the work that you do and in, in your life. Um, this is a pretty wild thing happening in America today. In 2000, 70% of Americans belong to a religious institution, but today that number is 50%. This has been a pretty precipitous decline in the um, ability or willingness of Americans to you know, go to church or to a religious institution on a regular basis, and I think that has lots of broad impacts in our society. Um, but there are a lot of reasons for that, but one of them is that Americans just have less free time. 
Mm -hmm. um, when you have to work 70 hours to get the same standard of living for your family that 40 hours would have gotten you a few decades ago, you don't have time to go to Wednesday night Bible study. You might not have the ability to even attend church or services on a Sunday. Um, you can talk about church if you want or if you don't want, but um, it, it is just true that some of the, the leisure time activities, some of the institutions that Americans found value and meaning in are less accessible when you have to work these long hours. You know, this is, it's work-life balance. And, and as I say, when you're working multiple jobs to live paycheck to paycheck, or you're working seven days a week, 12 hours a day, something's, something else is sacrificed in that. And, and, uh, uh, and that's it's what ends up happening. You, 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 you have to sacrifice, you know, uh, ability to go to church. If it's something else to do on a Sunday, maybe you get a Sunday off and you haven't slept all week and you spend the whole day sleeping. I mean, that, that is a reality a lot of workers face. Um, on, on some of the schedules they work. Um, well, uh, listen, I agree with you. I think we, we should have a, an interest in leisure time, right? We should have an interest in making sure that people are able to find value outside of work. A lot of people find value in work, and I'm glad that they do, but a lot of people find more value by the institutions and the social clubs and the churches that they affiliate and spend time with outside of work, but that is just less accessible for people today, and that should be a, a public policy interest of the United States Congress, and I appreciate uh, this, this hearing allowing us to talk about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There you have it, a 32-hour work week. Who wouldn't want that? But I want you to keep in mind that he is a Democrat, and he was focusing on democratic things, including workers' rights. But at the core of his thinking was that people need to have an environment where they can attend church on Sunday. Two sides of the political aisle who are sworn enemies that are both very concerned about getting people into church and getting them into church on Sunday. Today, I want you to understand that Revelation 13 paints a picture that is very inclusive. And by inclusive, I mean that everyone is going to be involved in persecuting people who remain faithful to God by keeping his commandments and that possess the faith of Jesus. It talks about a power that's going to compel everyone on earth to form an image to the beast, meaning to form a union of church and state. And they will compel people to worship on that day that God did not ordain. We can see it in Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. It says, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had a wound by a sword and did live. Based on this verse, we can see that the entire earth is going to be involved in this battle. Verse 16 goes on to say, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And I will add to that, Republican, and Democrat. Revelation 17 verse 13 describes it as the world having one mind and that the people will give their power and strength unto the beast, meaning that the world will be united in supporting and propping up the ideas and policies of the papacy. And I want you to know that this is going to be done by people on both sides of the aisle. Right now, there are so many that are fighting to make a point that the other side is completely evil at worst or completely deluded at best. However, soon enough, if you decide to remain faithful to God, the factions and political parties that we may be supporting are going to come together to find a new enemy. And that enemy will be those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. In commenting on the worldwide pressure that will be brought to the faithful, the Desire of Ages puts it this way, in the last great conflict of the controversy with Satan, those that are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off. Because they refuse to break his law in obedience to earthly powers, they will be forbidden to buy or sell. It will finally be decreed that they shall be put to death. Now don't miss this. It says every earthly support will be cut off. That means support from the left, and that means support from the right. If you're in the United States, that means support from Democrats and support from Republicans will be cut off. If you're on the island of Jamaica, where I was born, then that means that support from the JLP and the PNP will be cut off. And whatever country you're in, you can insert your political parties there, liberal or conservative. So if we're getting caught up in left versus right, then it means we need to ask ourselves a serious question. Who are we fighting for? Who are we really standing with? 
In the book of Joshua, we find Joshua being visited by the captain of the Lord's host. Joshua realized that he was speaking with a supernatural being from heaven, and he wanted to find out if heaven was on our side or their side. Let me say that again. He wanted to find out if God and heaven was on our side or their side. And you can read it for yourself. It says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went out unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? In other words, Joshua is asking a similar question that many of us are asking today. Lord, are you for us or for our enemies, the Democrats? And some are asking, Lord, are you for us or for our enemies, the Republicans? What's happening right now is that everyone is trying to lay hold of God and claim that God is for them and not for the others. And is it possible that we are taking our eyes off of the main focus of the work that God requires of us as we try to prove our point? With that in mind, I want you to see how the captain of the Lord's hosts responds to Joshua's question regarding whose side he was on. And the answer was simple, one word. The King James Version says, nay. The New King James Version says, no. The New International Version says, neither. One word that shows no partiality. And when it comes to people and our political parties, God does not discriminate. He doesn't choose sides. What he says is, nay. But as captain of the host of the Lord, am I come? In other words, God wanted Joshua to understand that he was not on their side for the sake of being on their side. Yes, the children of Israel had the law of God and the oracles for how they and we are to live our lives. But God was not in the business of picking sides. God has always been and always will be in the business of saving souls. His primary focus is on changing hearts. His primary focus is not on changing legislation. That was and always will be his concern. Now that doesn't mean that we can't vote for the issues of the day, but we need to understand where our focus should be. So we've seen what God is concerned with, but what is humanity really concerned with? Humanity is concerned with self. Humanity is concerned with their own self-interest. And as this relates to the end of time and the obsession to protect Sunday through legislation, we find a commonality that will eventually lead the left and the right to come together. A commonality that will bring the sworn enemies together. And as I record this video a few days shortly before Good Friday and Easter Sunday, I'm reminded of the story of Christ and how he was crucified and how his enemies came together to persecute and crucify him. This is the story found in Luke chapter 23, and it says, And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught, and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him again to Pilate. And the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. I hope you caught that. Two men with opposing views, dare I say opposing political views, that were at enmity, meaning they hated each other, they were enemies, and in one day they became friends and worked together to kill Jesus. The religious leaders and the king of Israel, also known as the church, and the governor Pontius Pilate, also known as the state, joining together to kill the Messiah. And why? Because it served their respective interests. So what about us? What does this have to do with Democrat and Republican, the left and the right, and the Sunday law? Well, soon enough there will be a common enemy. Just like that woman we saw in the video, more and more conservatives will say the fast spreading corruption is largely attributable to the desecration of the so-called Christian Sabbath and that the enforcement of Sunday observance would greatly improve the morals of society. And the political left will focus on the great conflagrations, the fierce tornadoes, the terrific hailstorms, the tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes, the famine, the pestilence, or as we say, the pandemic. In other words, the changes in the climate. The left is already heralding these things and saying that we need to have Sundays off for climate change to save the planet. And eventually the left and the right will find a commonality and the right will join in and say that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, 
that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced, and that those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. Eventually, everyone will come together to try to save the earth. And what about the temporal prosperity? Everyone will want to save the economy. And what about workers' rights and family time on Sunday? Well, that's something that everyone can agree with. And you can see it in this article where people believe that Sunday can be a means to bring both sides of the political aisle together. And obviously, we've already seen it in the documents of Project 2025. So the answer to the question that we began with today, who is going to call for the passing of a Sunday law which will remove freedom of conscience? The Democrats or the Republicans? The left or the right? The liberals or the conservatives? The answer to those questions is yes, yes, and yes. It's clear from Revelation 13 that the entire world will be involved in this movement, regardless of their political affiliations. However, with that in mind, this one thing is clear. Those that lead out in this movement are going to be religious zealots that are trying to save the nation, just like it was in Christ's day. And you can see that connection here on page 615 of The Great Controversy. It says, as the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom, and religious and secular authorities have combined to enforce the observance of the Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them objects of universal execration. It will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and a law of the state ought not to be tolerated, that it is better for them to suffer than for the whole nation to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. The same argument many centuries ago was brought against Christ by the rulers of the people. It is expedient for us, said the wily Caiaphas, that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. This argument will appear conclusive and a decree will finally be issued against those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, denouncing them as deserving of the severest punishment and giving the people liberality after a certain time to put them to death. Romanism in the old world and apostate Protestantism in the new will pursue a similar course toward those who honor all the divine precepts. Religious and secular authorities will indeed join together. However, it's clear that apostate Protestantism will take the lead in this movement. Whether those apostate Protestants are Democrat or Republican makes no difference to me. All that matters to me is that I am not choosing a political side for this kingdom. I am choosing to align myself with the kingdom of God, and I pray that you will too. If you've been blessed and enlightened by this video, or what we like to call digital tracks, then I want to invite you to help us spread the word by sharing, liking, and commenting as it helps us reach a wider audience. Please remember, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and God is calling for us to focus our energies on leading people to repentance instead of just leading them to the ballot box. If we keep that thought in mind, by God's grace, we can finish this work as quickly as possible. God bless, and please remember to keep the prophetic eye.